Matthew 1, 18 through 25. And uh, I wanted to deal with an issue in there, a sub-idea, that God is dealing with Joseph as a father to one who's going to be an adopted father figure. What I saw this year as I went through there is the test that God the Father gave Joseph about God's son that was going to be put into his care, and he runs him through a test to see if he's qualified. And so when that kind of rung my bell a little bit, uh, I got to thinking about that. And so this year, what I did is I went into a lot of mechanics of practical application in the life of Joseph as he's being tested by fa the father to leave his child with him so that he doesn't interfere with the child's mission from its heavenly father. His mission is to go to the cross. And we know that he told the mother that this would be a very painful experience for her. It would be like having a sword thrust into her heart. <clears throat> and so I've, I've taken that as kind of a background in the way I studied this, this Christmas season. And we come down to verses uh, 24 and 25 in our ninth and final lesson on this Christmas series, and it deals with Joseph did as commanded. If you, learn, if, you, if you learn nothing else from this Christmas series as we walk away from it this, this year, understand how important it is to God when he gives you his directive will, how important it is for you to be obedient to it no matter what the circumstances. If we learn anything else from Joseph, how important it was for Joseph to be obedient no matter to the word of God, no matter what the circumstances appeared. Would you agree with that? I mean, things got pretty bleak in his life when his sweetheart came back from visiting Elizabeth for three months and was three months pregnant. And this was quite a struggle in his life. But we learned from this lesson, one of the great lessons, if you're positive to the word of God, in the midst of all your struggles with the circumstances of how that could apply in human viewpoint thinking about it, if you're positive to the word of God, he will bring you through it. If you're positive, if you have positive relation to the word of God, no matter what you're going through in life and no matter how bleak it looks based on your opinion, on the opinion of a lot of other people who are in agreement with that. If you're a positive word of God, God will, God will move heaven and earth for you to see that you can get that will of God in your soul and do well with it. Because God's motive is Ephesians 6.6. 6. That's his motive. His whole motive in Bible study is to get your heart prepared to love the Word of God and to love doing it no matter what the circumstances in life are. Doing the will of God from your heart, not based on anything you see in temporal living. Because it's all about what you see in eternal living with your feet on earth that's important. And so... We, we look at this one more time with Joseph when he, he, he has struggled enormously with what's on his plate. And it says, and he did as commanded. Now, he didn't know any more then than he did before about Mary except clarity. What Gabriel was to give him was clarity on the will of God. And that, and when he heard it and had it with clarity, meaning he heard it and understood it, believed it, it was now ready for application, and it went right in. It didn't wait a week. 
He didn't wait a week. He didn't wait a month. He didn't wait half a year or a year or another opportunity. Listen, the Bible, in, the Bible indicates that he did it immediately. You know what that's called? That's called walking by faith. He did it immediately. He had done the thought process and it was all wrong. <laughs> he had talked to, the, talked to the lawyers. He had talked to the pastors. He had talked to blue in his face. And he was all wrong on it. And God brought him, because he was positive, God brought him clarity on the issue. Now make a decision because you were, you were, you were half-witted. Because you went whirly. When you go whirly, you go squirrely. Now just remember that. That's not the t topic of the lesson, but remember that. When you go whirly, you go squirrely. And he went whirly with his viewpoint out of rationalism and empiricism on pregnancy. And uh, what, a mess he, what a mess he got himself in. It's called self-induced misery. And so here we are in Matthew 25, uh, 24 and 25. Now, in my introduction, I want to tell you something that's really interesting. Matthew 24, 20, which we already know is one sentence. It's one Greek sentence. What's unusual about this Greek sentence, and I wrote it at the top of your paper, it has six main verbs. Can you imagine? Six main verbs. They're all indicatives. There are six indicatives. They're, those are main verbs. They're finite verbs. They're the engine in a car. This is like a train, sixth engine train. I mean, you know it's carrying a load, right? When you see six engines, you know there's a big hill or a heavy load. Something's going on. This is six engines. You don't need six of them. And, and they're sequential. There's three and 24. There's three of them in 24, and there's three of them in 25. And so I wrote them down so you wouldn't miss one of the most important things, at least in understanding this, is these six main verbs, sequences of importance to fulfill the will of God in Joseph's life. He's got to get him off the wrong path, back on the right path. He's got to come off because he, when he hit the fork in the road, he went the wrong way. He's got to bring him back to the fork, get him back on the right road. And then he tells him, boom, boom, boom. And part of this is all about that. In, the, in verse 24, you see Joseph did as commanded and took Mary as his wife. All right, you see that? Now, if you looked at your, at your text, you would see it. Those are all main verbs. In verse 25, it says he kept or did not know sexually Mary. She gave birth and he called his name Jesus. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to circle gave birth because all of this is about that. All of that is about this. You see, that's, a, that's an enormous idea. You see, God's whole deal with Joseph and Mary is to bring his son out of Galatians 4.4 at the perfect time in human history. A child is going to be born of a woman born under the law. Boom, his name is Jesus Christ. Galatians 4.4. And, and we're sitting in the middle of the drama of this great play. The unfolding of Galatians 4.4 is where we're, we're in the drama of it. We're in the, we're in the drama. These are, present, these are present, powerful, indicative. We're sitting in the presence of it. We're sitting where Joseph, Joseph arises from his sleep, and, and he did as commanded by the angel and took Mary as his wife. And, and, and that, listen... Now we're in the six-month period. They're married, and she's got six months to give birth. And it says, and during those six months, he had no sexual relations with her. That's honeymoon time. Remember those? Uh, can you go back that far? How about yesterday? That was honeymoon period. Didn't keep her. Didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to that baby. That's how important this... Her giving birth was to Joseph. Now, he was, in my understanding of the scriptures at least, he was never told to do that. He did that on his own. 
to the father. Say, it's a father to father thing. Oh, come on, please. It's a father to father. It's respect. And she gives birth, and he does what he was told to do, call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from the sin. That's anointed Messiah. And listen, that's all about mission, isn't it? He will save his people from the... That's all about the messianic mission. All of that is in this, six, this period of time, all focused around the birth of Christ. That's what the Father cares about. That's what the directive will. See, all these other circumstances... See, there's a... You could write a book about the circumstances in your life and, and listen, and the, the whole thing could be one, one sentence. She gave birth. And so never lose focus of the importance of the will of God in your life. Doing the will of God from your heart is what pleases the Father. That's the exercise of faith. That's what pleases him. And all this stuff, the moving of the furniture in your life and all these circumstances, look, they're, they're, they're either objects that keep you focused on the mission or obstacles that distract you from it. The mission is simple. Always keep the main thing the main thing and keep it simple. The second interesting thing, and, I'm, and this is not my study, it's my introduction. It could well be my study if I run out of time. The second interesting thing in the Greek syntax, the other thing that I found to be very interesting that I share with you is this. One Greek sentence, five main, six main verbs. Now watch this. There, is, there are five definite articles. Now in the Greek language, when you find a definite article, it's a spotlight. <laughs> and you pay attention to it. When you're in a drama, when you're in a narrative, when you got stuff going on, those definite articles focus on people and events that are very important in the context. Now, the context started way up in verse 18. We're down at the close of this deal. This, and watch, I'm a, and so I wrote them down because you can't always see them in English. Now, listen, why they're important is that this is a narrative. This is something going on in real time. This is drama. Would you agree? This is, listen, this is high drama in the life of Joseph. I mean, when he gets through this, he'll say, listen, I wouldn't give anything for going through it, but I wouldn't ever want to do it again. You ever heard that? This is this kind of an event. All right, so here we got, we got definite articles. Now I want you, there's spotlight. Keep people and events in a drama going on. Here's what you got. You got four of them listed in 24. The spotlight hits Joseph. The spotlight hits him sleeping in bed, <laughs> deep sleep. The spotlight hits the angel appearing to Joseph in a dream. Are you with me? And the wife. Mary, Mary. Right? Take Mary as your wife. <clears throat> now watch verse 25. D verse 25, we have one. L watch where it is. The name. Call his name. There's a definite article. Listen, the definite article is, is with, the, with the name, not with the name Jesus. Call his name Jesus, and here's why. Here's how we're going to define the name Jesus, which wasn't an unusual name. We're, we're talking about Hebrew people. But he says, I'm going to give it a new meaning. In the dictionary, before it was number one, we're changing number one and putting it down to three, and we're putting number one up here now. The name Jesus. The name Jesus is going to be defined in a different way. Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. Eh? So the next time you read... Matthew 24, 25, pay attention to the key people and key events because the writer, Matthew, is certainly telling you to do that in the Greek language. Let's stop and have a word of prayer. We'll talk about a few things about this that I would like you to know other than how it was introduced to us. Okay? Matthew 24, 25.
I give you Moses Silas as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. Why? The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't live it, nor can you learn it. In carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, avert sins, or others. We mentioned those to just bring them into categorical thinking for you. For confession, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That cleansing is the work of Christ from the cross extended to the Christian life in dealing with personal sin that has interfered with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You can't do anything for Christ in carnality. This puts you back into spirituality where all the game is played. The Christian way of life is lived under the power of the Holy Spirit. It's called walking by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us by automobile and Internet. We pray the people at home on the Internet would have the same courtesy as we require in classroom. Respect for the time, respect for the word, respect for the teaching. Find something from this lesson that will change your life in such a dramatic way that other people will notice it. And even if they don't, God will. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we go. I'm going to look at five aspects. Probably some of it will be part of a doggy bag. But we're going to look at five aspects of the idea that Joseph did as commanded. What is interesting to me, this should be a question. I don't know that it's on your paper as a question, but it should be. What did the angel of the Lord reveal to Joseph during his deep sleep that caused him to do a complete, I mean, a complete turnaround regarding his viewpoint of Mary's pregnancy and divorce. I mean, he did. In him, he goes to bed, he gets up, and his life is completely different. In a way he thinks, not the way he feels. Now, a lot of us go to bed, and we get up the next morning, we go like, hey, wow, <sighs> I need that rest. That's not what he, no. Mm, that's not, I mean, it, it changed his life, not his not the, way he felt, not the way he felt, but the way he believed. You understand that? You know what he got? You know what he got while he was in deep sleep? The angel, the teaching angel of the Messiah came and taught him a key element that he was missing because he's positive word of God. He went, he went to a fork in the road and took the wrong road. He stopped him on that road and he brought him back to the fork in the road. He said, now let me tell you this. Let me clear, clear up some things in the, the way you think. And, and he cleared it up. And when he got up, he went, shabing. I wish I had some. I wish I could pass those pills out to you today. And I said, well, if you didn't give it to church, take one of these before you go to bed tonight. And it'll ring a bell. That's snake oil in it. If I gave it to you, it'd be snake oil. When Gabriel gives it to you, it's a, different, a complete different way of life. But here's the truth. God, isn't God faithful? Is not God faithful? Look down a little further on your paper. Look down a little further. Well, look down further on your paper to point four, where you, you're going to find 1 Corinthians 10, 14 to make my point. 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 13. No temptation or testing has overtaken you. Watch it. Watch the, I, I put it in bold print. Watch this now. I'm going to come back to point one. I'm just making a point. The word you is used four times, and the word God or he is used three. And listen, this is Joseph and God. Joseph, here's Joseph, and here's God. And it's about getting Joseph in line with what God wants. It's not, I mean, God could come in and just go whack. <laughs> a guy's God. He can come here and go like, he could roar like a lion. He could spank him like a king. I don't know. But God doesn't do that when you have positive volition. He does that when you don't have positive volition. But he, when, God treats you so tender when you have positive volition for the truth of God's word. No testing has overtaken you, the writer says. Watch the word you. Has not over, has, 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 no temptation has overtaken your testing. 
But such is common to man. That's human experience with us. Temporal life. Listen, God is faithful. That's the first time. Who? That's the second time. God. God who will not. God who will not. Now, that's top authority. I always like when God says, nobody going to mess with you. I say it. Oh, you don't know the, I know, I said it. Look what he says. God is faithful, that's a principle, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. You know what able is? It's, it's Romans 4.21. You ought to learn that verse. This is Romans 4.21. You know what able is? Listen to, listen to Romans 4.21. God is able. See, he's God is faithful. But here's what he says about faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. God who is able to, per, per, to perform what he's promised. God is able. Listen, a heart for God is one that knows I'm not able, but he is. God is always able to complete what he puts in your heart is his will. Come on now. Do you understand that? I'm going to say this one more time. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what? What you're able. What is that? That's the word of God in your life. Romans 4.21 says God is able... To do what he promised. You always need to be able, by the word of God resident in your soul, to match the right will for the right circumstance in your life. The right categorical doctrine to the right circumstance in your life. You should always be doing that. That is God's desire. And when your heart is in his desire then you are able because you have the knowledge, the knowledge of the will of God for the circumstance it needs to be applied to. And when you understand, you say, oh, I don't see how this can get done. I don't see it. And a and, and hundred naysayers out there going, nay, 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 nay. Listen, the word of God is done by God. You're always able to have God connect to your uh, able to get it done. Come on now, that's grace. God is able to do what he's promised. He's not asking you to do it. Are you able to understand that he's able to do it? If you do, you got it. Back to point one. Back to point one. First, Joseph, here's the first point. Joseph exercised primary, listen, watch that, primary positive volition. Now, you see that little circle down there? There's a, should be, a, that's a circle. It says, you go clockwise. It says, hearing faith takes you to believing faith, takes you to applying faith, takes you to completing faith, and, you've, and then you come back to the circle for, you've done 101, now you're ready for 201. Are you with me? That's called spirit. That cycle, you just call it, that just that's spiritual growth. You know, that spiritual growth isn't. I heard the word of God. Spiritual growth is not. I heard, I believe the word of God. Spiritual growth is. I I took it to completion. Well, you better go back and read the book of James or pick it up on on, on my series that I'm in right now. So over on this side of your paper, see that line drew through the middle? There's two sides of the faith cycle. There's the hearing, believing side, and there's applying, completing side. Now listen, primary positive volition goes on the hearing, believing side. Hearing the word of God, understanding the word of God, believing the word of God. That's the whole system of primary negative uh, positive volition. Primary positive volition. I heard it. See, I heard it. I understand it. I've got clarity on the will of God. I believe it. Now we're ready to apply it. Now we're ready to walk by faith. Once we're capable of walking by faith, now we're on the other side of this, applying and completing. 
Here's where secondary positive volition is important. Joseph got clarity when he went to bed that night. He was already determined that he was going to divorce her because she had committed adultery with another man. I'm going to divorce her. I'm going to do it in private. But I'm going to divorce her in the morning. God intervenes and goes, hmm, bad idea. I handpicked you to be, to be the adopted father. I handpicked you to be the adopted father. Whether you understand or not, I want you to know this. And we got to get some things in clarity. We've got to understand how this child is supposed to be raised. And the first thing I want to get clarity, I'm in charge. <laughs> but you've been handpicked, Bubba. So what we're looking at over here on this side is secondary negative volition. He goes to bed, but he, because he's positive, he thinks he's doing the right thing categorically doctrine. I'll talk about it in a moment. But he wasn't, was he? He hit a fork in the road and took the wrong path. But he, was thought he thought his heart was doing the right thing with God. He thought he was being respectful and showing mercy and all this kind of stuff. But listen, it was, listen, it, it, you know what it was produced? Listen to me. When he was on the wrong path, even though he thought he was doing all the right things for God, he, 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 he was based on false assumption of doctrine. His doctrine was screwy. Come on, please tell me, you know, his doctrine was screwy. He got, this is my ninth lesson. But God cares about that. He's got positive volition. He wants to do the right thing. But he's walking by sight. So he's, he stops and moves, pulls him back and says, let's get on the right path. I mean, that's how this stuff is working. And so secondary negative volition, he, 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 he comes back to this. Look, at you're, you're about to make a bad decision. I mean, if you get up in the morning and go through with this divorce, I'm going to have to pull you off stage. You're not my guy. I can't leave my child with you. I'm not going to do that. So this is a crucial part. Listen, when he gets up in the morning, gets clarity, gets clarity, and in secondary volition, it says, and he did, he did, as commanded, took Mary as his wife, and the rest of it's a piece of history of positive work in his life. It's a wonderful thing. I'm telling you, that faith cycle is dynamite. In your life, that's dynamite. Let me show you something. L let me show you something about that. The next thing that Joseph did is secondary positive volition. He gets up and he applies the revealed word of God. That's really important to this. So on the one side over here, you see where on that one side... On the right side of where the line is drawn, hearing and believing, that's where the will of God is identified. That's where the will of God. You, listen, you know why you come to church? To, why you come to church? To learn the will of God. The word brings you the will. The will brings you the work. What does God want me to do with my life? What is, what is, what, what's on my plate that I need to re-examine? See, one of the things you should do is some of the things on your plate, you ought to go home and re-examine if you're di on the right path doctrinally. Categorical doctrine is key. And so, on this part, we got the will of God, Ephesians 6, 6, and on this side, on the, on the left side of that application and completion, you have the work, like, like the James 2.18 that we're going to talk about Wednesday night. James, we're in the second chapter now. And so when Joseph gets up, here, here's point two. Here's what happens to Joseph. This is, this is a, a wonderful part of the story of Joseph because in his heart, he's positive. He, on a false assumption, walking by sight, he went down the wrong path. God stopped him and said, let's come back to the fork and let me show you something. He did, and Joseph went on the right path. That's a wonderful thing. Listen, you know why? You know why that always works this way? Because God is faithful. Whether you are or not, he is, right? Come on, you know 2 Timothy 2.13. Come on. And so in point number two, what, here's what I love about this. Joseph immediately stopped walking by sight and immediately started walking by faith. Immediately. I got clarity. I got it. And listen, 
No matter, listen, he, he calls the lawyer up in the morning and says, look, not divorcing, calls up everybody, nor do I got, and, and, listen, calls up his mom and dad and all the other side and says, I mean, calls up Mary and said, let's get married. Let's get married right away. I mean, he took charge took, and, and cleaned up his plate. He took charge. Listen, he took charge, but he was on the wrong road. This time he's on the right road and he takes charge. And listen, what a relief that must have been to Mary. Now I wonder what she's going through. Can this guy be trusted? <laughs> like when she comes home praying, can she be trusted? He's about ready to throw under a bus. Now I'm wondering if she's going, by. apparently she's okay because there's nothing to discuss about it. But I'm thinking now, well, can I trust him? I don't know. I'm just thinking. I was just thinking out of, out of the box a moment. This is how you, listen, stay positive word of God. God, it's, listen, God, listen, God will not allow you, right? Did, did he, when it said God is faithful, did he not say he, he who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, did it, is that not a promise? Listen, if it's not, but I'm down the wrong road somewhere. I see that as a promise. To my ability, my ability to apply God to my circumstance, all I have to do is be sure that I'm on the right categorical doctrine for the trip, right? Because he'll do what he said, Right? Now, Joseph makes a false assumption, goes down that doctrinal path, and you know, what's, you know what that whole trip is? Self-induced misery, right? I mean, he, he, he's full of self, self-induced misery. He, he, he's in a lot of miserable places in his life he doesn't need to be. And this God understands it, and God rescues him. You know, you know that, first, that first Corinthians 10, 13? Listen to the second part of this. You will not be tempted about what you were able, but with the temptation, the testing, will provide the way of escape also. Also, also, see, we miss words like that. You mean he put that testing on? Oh, my goodness. Well, did he put the word in you? Yeah. Well, he put the testing on you to see if you'd trust the word. See, he don't give you the test before the word. He gives you the word before the test so that you are able. And if you are able, he will move heaven and earth this year sure, if you're able. Meaning, I will trust God to do what he promised. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, you have no idea how good that is. You be tempted, but with a temptation will provide a way of escape so that you, there's my you again, so that you, Ron Adamo, will be able to endure it. Endure it. See, when you know it's the will of God, the endurance is, is, is okay. When you're going through it and you don't know that God's is for it, then it's miserable. I don't know, I don't know, what should I do? What's the Bible say? You know, it's not, you know, it's not brain surgery. What's the Bible say? Well, I put down there the three categories of suffering for you to look at. Divine discipline, neither Mary and Joseph there, but undeserved suffering, Mary's going through it. And self-induced misery, Joseph is going through it. That's well worth your time. Here's point number three. Joseph's problem is he's walking by sight. He got to the fork in the road, and he, he walked by sight, not by faith. You only walk in one way or the other. Come on now. They didn't give you a third or fourth choice here. And this is true in your life and mine. Listen, you're either walking in the flesh or in the spirit. You're either walking by faith or, or by sight. There's no, there's no neutral place. Only place that's neutral is when you hit the fork. <laughs> How important is the word of God? 
you must always match up the categorical doctrine with the circumstance of your life. They must match. The directive will of God will supply you geographical, mental, and operational success. But you always have to match them up. you got to ask yourself, is this what the Bible says? Listen, Joseph, his false assumption was that Mary got pregnant, committed adultery by another man, and therefore he should divorce her. What he should have asked himself, is there any mention in the Bible of a Jewish virgin girl from the house of David getting pregnant? It would have solved. Was there? Yes. Isaiah 7, 14. If he'd have kept the main issue, the main issue, what's your problem, David? Uh, Joseph, you look terrible today. What's wrong with you? Oh, I can't talk about it. Well, come over here and let's pray about it. Then you get to scoop, don't you? <laughs> well, Joseph, what do you do? Well, the man... What? What I did, I've talked to a thousand people and they all said she committed adultery with the natural law of copulation. A thousand people in the church said that's how it works. Did you check the Bible first? No. Don't you think it might be a good idea to just check it out? What did Mary say? Mary, Mary swears, but... Nobody believes her. Who believes that? That's quite a tale, isn't it? But it's not if you open the Bible. If you open the Bible and go to concordance and try to find a virgin somewhere, you know, the only place you'll find it <laughs> is a concordance. But if you find one, then you run it down and find out what it means. And you would come to a messianic passage that was dynamite. Listen, this passage is as big as 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 13 through what it talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture of the church. This passage of Isaiah 7, 14 was hotter, was the hottest. Listen, everybody was talking about the coming of Christ. When, when Jesus Christ, there's Simon goes like, holy catfish. I had a baby in my hand. Anna wants to come in and says, holy smoke. See, they're in the temple and everything's holy. I mean, this is a big event. And listen, they were all looking for it. If Joseph went to the Bible, if he'd paid attention, if he'd went to another assumption, what does the Bible say first before he went off riding in the wrong direction? See, what am I trying to tell you? See, this is, listen, he went... He went, he went by walking by sight, that's rationalism and empiricism, checked everybody out. Uh, a thousand people would have told him, yeah, the natural law of copulation. But she's, the main idea is Mary got pregnant, she's a virgin. I know she's a virgin. Mary knew she's a virgin. God knew she was a virgin. How, do, how come we didn't check that out? Same reason you don't check it out. When something comes to your life, you go the natural way. You go, you go, you jump off and, and walk by sight. And the first thing you know, you got your life. You've built a whole bunch of self-induced misery in your life because you didn't check it out. I mean, what guy in this whole room, if your light goes on, the engine light goes on, don't pull over and check that. Now, you may not ask for directions, but you'll check your light when it goes red. You'll drive 200 miles out of the way and your wife will tell you 26,000 times we ought to stop and ask directions. <coughs> I'm the man, I drive the car, I know. That light, engine light goes on, he's looking, boy, he's pulled over, he's stopped, he's flagging people down. So, Joseph's inner dialogue, Joseph's inner dialogue with human viewpoint resulted in walking by sight it led him down the path of rationalism and empiricism. All the natural ideas of life, worldly ideas of life, apart from the Word of God. 
Joseph, does the Bible mention a Jewish version of the house of David getting pregnant? And the answer is yes. Isaiah 7, 14. But you see, his false assumption about Mary's pregnancy led to a false interpretation of adultery, led to a false expectation Mary can't be trusted for marriage, led him to a false application of private divorce. That's a whole lot of stuff that shouldn't be there. It wouldn't have been there had he checked out. Is it possible in the Bible... The Bible should be your first source, not your last of information. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians. Open the book and look at that. You know, when you read 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3, he lays out, Paul lays out, beware of worldly thinking. Worldly thinking is squirrely thinking. In the third chapter, as he begins to close down this section of study on worldly thinking and how dangerous it is, how dangerous it is to categorical Bible doctrine thinking, which reveals the will of God to you, listen to what he says. And here's what's Joseph's problem. Let no man deceive himself. You know how he got deceived? Worldly thinking. It went rationalism, empiricism, not faith. He should have checked the Bible. What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? I can't tell you how many people come in for counseling to me. I say to them, I, I, let's identify your problem in a word. Then we'll talk about it for two hours. Let's identify it in one word. And so I try to get them to identify it. Because if I can, then I, can, I say to them, what's the Bible say about that? I don't know. You got a concordance in the back of your Bible? Wait, you came to me, you didn't even bring your Bible. <laughs> That's like going to a pediatric doctor without a child. Well, how can I help you? How old are you, 38? I don't do 30. Well, I'm the only child. I don't do them at 38. If you come see me, bring your Bible. Let no man deceive himself. You know what keeps you from doing that? What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? What? I, no, I don't want 16,000 people's opinion. Give me what the Bible says. How many places does it say it? Have you read them all? Have you looked at them? Because if you come to me, that's what we would do. We'd open the Bible, look in the concordance, identify your problem, look in the concordance. If you didn't know what it was, you, you think I'm going to give it to you? Listen, if I give it to you without you finding the answer, I'm going to have to charge you for the visit. Because it's not any good. Because you, you're not open to Grace. So he says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age. Now he's, he's studied chapter 1, 2, and 3 to explain that. So I can't do that. I can't do that in a, in a, in, in a microwave second. If, if any man among you thinks, Joseph, that he is wise in this age, let him become foolish that he may become wise. And then he gives him, have you checked the word of God? Where do you get that idea? Have you checked the word of God? See, that's verse 19 20. Have you checked the word of God? You're so lucky to go to this church. Now, you don't know that unless you visit a whole bunch of other churches. You are lucky. And I'm lucky to have you. Because we get down to business. We get down to practical business. What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? Let no man deceive himself. How does he do it? Not studying the Bible. My goodness. All 
off into worldly thinking. Worldly thinking is squirrely thinking. What's the Bible say? It's not complicated. Oh, you probably have to be a theologian to understand. No, you just have to be practical. What's the Bible say? When the red, in, when the light goes on, and the, you know, you just what's what's going on? Joseph, listen. Here's my fourth point. Number five is doggy bag. Joseph had the spiritual maturity of categorical Bible doctrine in his soul to make a decision compatible with the directive will of God. How do I know that? Watch this. If you got Matthew 1, you got Matthew 1, we'll open it up. Matthew 1, Matthew 1, 24, 25. Look, in verse 23, that's the last word the angel had. Verses 20 through 23 is what the angel told him. Are you with me? Pay attention. You paying attention? Joe, are you paying? No, okay. You know, uh, Joe, how long have we known each other? Boy, you were just a kid when I met you, weren't you? Uh, and you, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. Joe sets in the word of God when it's being taught, just like he did when I met him at Troy University. He's a student of the word of God. I mean, I dropped back in those days, Marion, and I st that's the same Joe I've known all my life. Joe, watch this now. Look at, the, the, Gabriel is through in verse 23. Watch what we got in 24, 25. Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took him and kept, and, and kept his wife. Well, look. Verse 22. Now, watch verse 22. I want to verse 22, not 24. Now, all this took place. Watch this now. What, what the angel tells him is in verse 20. In verse 21. And, 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 he's, and, and um, in verse 20, when she'll be a child. Now, look at verse 22. See, Joseph... The Gabriel's talking in 20 and 21. Watch 22. Now all this took place. That what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled saying, where did he get that? The angel didn't tell him that. See, we're, we're in a footnote. Verse 22 is a footnote. We're in footnote talk from 22 through 25. We're in footnotes. Now, all this took place that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, a virgin. Guess what Joseph did when the angel got through with him? He got his Bible out and looked up Isaiah 7, 14 and went, Shawing, I could have had a V8. How about that? Now, all this took place. That's a footnote. Matthew, all this took place that was spoken of the prophet 700 years ago. There's that verse. How'd you get that? Well, when the angel got died through, of, let's see, a virgin, a, a Jewish virgin from the house of David becomes pregnant. I know that. I got that in Bible school. That's what I'm thinking. You can do with it what you want. That's what I did. Joseph had the spiritual maturity of Bible doctrine and soul to make a decision compatible with the directive will of God. But you see, prior to that, he went subjective in the flesh of worldly thinking and walking by sight. He went down the wrong doctrinal path based on a false assumption. The angel of the Lord was sent by God to clarify the directive will of God to Joseph because of his positive volition. You see, God obligates himself to positive volition. He made a home visit. <laughs> he made a home visit, went into the bedroom. He went into the bedroom and went into deep sleep to get him. That's hiding, boy. You think God won't visit your house, visit your bedroom to have a talk with you about some things going on in your life? 
Joseph said, Woo! I'm telling you, he showed up at my house. I was naked in bed and got me in a dream. I, I don't know. The Bible didn't say he was naked in bed. I just <laughs> thought I'd throw that in there to catch your attention. All right. Well, number five, that's well, you're through, well worth your read. And um, that's your doggy bag. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these who have come our way to study with us, both by the automobile and the Internet, and have stayed with us this hour to look at this life of Joseph, how important the Word of God is. God is faithful to His Word. He's faithful to be sure you have clarity for understanding what is needed to be applied and then apply it, walk it out, trust God, look above, not in your circumstances, Look to God who is able to walk you through your circumstances so that you can see the bright side of life, not the dark side of self-induced misery if I walk on the wrong path. Father, I pray you would make clarity of this in the hearts of all of us today. In Jesus' name, amen.